Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man phoning a woman who lives in an English city called Banford to get some advice about moving to that city. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, Linda speaking. Oh, hi, Linda. This is Matt Brooks. Alex White gave me your number. He said you'd be able to give me some advice about moving to Banford. Yes. Alex did mention you. How can I help? Well, first of all, which area to live in? Well, I live in Dalton, which is a really nice suburb. Not too expensive, and there's a nice park. Sounds good. Do you know how much it would be to rent a two-bedroom flat there? Yeah, you should be able to get something reasonable for... £850 per month. That's what people typically pay. You certainly wouldn't want to pay more than £900. That doesn't include bills or anything. No, that sounds all right. I'll definitely have a look there. Are the transport links easy from where you live? Well, I'm very lucky. I work in the city centre so I don't have to use public transport. I go by bike. Oh, I wish I could do that. Is it safe to cycle around the city? Yes, it's fine. And it keeps me fit. Anyway, driving to work in the city centre would be a nightmare because there's hardly any parking. And the traffic during the rush hour can be bad. I'd be working from home, but I'd have to go to London one or two days a week. Oh, that's perfect. Getting to London is no problem. There's a fast train every 30 minutes, which only takes 45 minutes. That's good. Yeah, the train service isn't bad during the week, and they run quite late at night. It's weekends that are a problem. They're always doing engineering work and you have to take a bus to Haddam and pick up the train there, which is really slow. But other than that, Banford's a great place to live. I've never been happier. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. There are some nice restaurants in the city centre and a brand new cinema, which has only been open a couple of months. There's a good art centre too. Sounds like Banford's got it all. Yes, we're really lucky. There are lots of really good aspects to living here. The schools are good. And the hospital here is one of the best in the country. 
Everyone I know who's been there's had a positive experience. Oh, I can give you the name of my dentist, too, in Bridge Street, if you're interested. I've been going to him for years, and I've never had any problems. Oh, OK, thanks. I'll find his number and send it to you. Thanks. That would be really helpful. Are you planning to visit Banford soon? Yes. My wife and I are both coming next week. We want to make some appointments with estate agents. I could meet you if you like and show you around. Are you sure? We'd really appreciate that. Either a Tuesday or Thursday is good for me. After 5.30. Thursday is preferable. Tuesday, I need to get home before 6 p.m. OK. Great. Let me know which train you're catching, and I'll meet you in the cafe outside. You can't miss it. It's opposite the station and next to the museum. Brilliant. I'll text you next week, then. Thanks so much for all the advice. No problem. I'll see you next week. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear the overseas student officer talking to some new students about the arrangements for an excursion to Ironbridge. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone, my name is Pamela Sutcliffe and most of you already know that I'm the Overseas Student Officer here at Salopian Technical College. Next Tuesday, the 28th of September, we have arranged an excursion for all new students to the important historical town of Ironbridge. We are hoping you'll all come, because not only is the history of Ironbridge very important and interesting, but also an excursion like this is a relaxed and fun way to get to know each other. Ironbridge is about 55 kilometres from here and we'll be travelling by the college bus, which holds 40 people. If there are more than that, we'll bring a couple of staff cars as well though I might ask you to indicate on the list if you have a car and would be willing to take a couple of passengers. The list I'm referring to is up there on the student notice board and if you would like to come on Tuesday, would you please add your name as soon as possible. By the way, could you please print your name clearly? I know some people have wonderful signatures, but often I'm afraid I can't read them, which can cause problems. So if we need extra transport and you could bring your car, can you tick the car column next to your name? 
Could you also add your student number and your telephone number, just in case there are any last minute changes and we have to contact you? The other information I need to give you is about lunch. There's a very nice little restaurant in Ironbridge which gives a 15% discount to the college when we bring groups. That means lunch is only about four pounds and they do good vegetarian meals too, so it's usually no problem for those of you on special diets. But if you prefer to eat your own food, that's fine too, either on the bus or in the park. But I'd encourage you to try the restaurant. Now talking of costs, I should tell you that the bus will only cost you £10 and if you bring your car, we'll pay for the petrol so you get a free trip in return for driving there. Will you please sign up by Saturday at 6pm at the latest? The list is closed after that. We will depart at 9.30am sharp on Tuesday morning so please make sure that you arrive at least 15 minutes before so that you can find a seat and get settled on the bus. Before the recorded message continues, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, as the message continues, answer questions 16 to 20. The college bus garage is behind the engineering workshop. It's quite easy to find. If you come here to the Student Union building, then walk east down the avenue until you get to the childcare centre on your left, and then turn left and walk past the sports centre and the tennis courts, which are both on your left. Cross over Central Square and opposite you is the Engineering Workshop. Walk around the back and you'll see the bus. Please wear comfortable shoes as we'll be walking around Ironbridge and be on our feet for most of the day. Wear a warm jacket and you might like to bring an umbrella and a backpack to put them in if the weather's warm and sunny, which we hope it will be, but of course we can't guarantee that. Certainly bring your cameras and any snacks or drinks for the bus journey there and back, which should take about an hour and a half each way. You should all check the notice board on Monday and we'll also put a note in your mailbox to confirm arrangements, so don't forget to check it. Now, why are we visiting Ironbridge? Well, Iron Bridge, as the name suggests, has got the original Iron Bridge. That is, the first ever iron bridge in the world. It was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution and for 40 years it led the world as Britain changed from an agricultural society into an industrial one. It's hard to imagine today that this pretty, sleepy little tourist town was one of the most important places in England for over a century. Just imagine 200 years ago People from all over Europe and even North America came to Ironbridge to learn about what was then the latest technology. Today it is listed as a World Heritage Site by the United Nations as they consider the unique collection of industrial monuments ranked alongside the Grand Canyon, the Pyramids and the Great Barrier Reef. One place that's fun to visit is Blist Hill which is a reconstruction of a small Victorian industrial town where people are working and living as they did a hundred years ago. I hope you'll enjoy the day. It's been a very popular excursion in previous years, so I'm looking forward to going again next Tuesday. Now don't forget to put your name on the list as soon as possible. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear two psychology students, called Tim and Laura, talking about Laura's work placement. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Laura. Could you spare a few minutes to talk about the work placement you did last summer? I'm thinking of doing one myself. Hi, Tim. Sure. Didn't you do yours at an environmental services company? That's right. It's only a very small company, and they needed someone to produce a company brochure. And I wanted to get some business experience, because I'm interested in a career in occupational psychology in a business environment. It was good, because I had overall responsibility for the project. What kind of skills do you think you developed on the placement? I mean, apart from the ones you already had. Did you have to do all the artwork for the brochure, the layout and everything? We hired the services of a professional photographer for that, I did have to use my IT skills to a certain extent because I cut and pasted text from marketing leaflets. But that didn't involve anything I hadn't done before. Do you think you got any better at managing your time and prioritizing things? You always used to say you had trouble with that. Oh, definitely. There was so much pressure to meet the project deadline. And I also got better at explaining things and asserting my opinions because I had to have weekly consultations with the marketing manager and give him a progress report. It sounds as if you got a lot out of it then. Absolutely. It was really worthwhile. But, you know, the company benefited too. Yes, they must have done. After all, if they'd used a professional advertising agency to produce their brochure instead of doing it in-house, presumably they'd have paid a lot more. Oh, yes. I worked it out. It would have been 250% more, and I thought the end result was good, even though we did everything on site. The company has quite a powerful computer, and I managed to borrow some scanning software from the university. The new brochure looks really professional. It enhances the image of the company straight away. So, in the long run, it should help them to attract clients and improve their sales figures? That's the idea, yeah. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Well, all in all, it sounds very positive. I think I'll go ahead and apply for a placement myself. How do I go about it? It's easy enough to do, because there's a government agency called STEP, S-T-E-P, that organizes placements for students. You should start by getting their booklet with all the details. I expect you can download one from their website. Actually, they've got copies in the psychology department. I've seen them there. I'll just go to the office and pick one up. Right. And then, if I were you, after I'd looked at it, I'd go over all the options with someone. I suppose I should ask my tutor's advice. He knows more about me than anyone. One of the career officers would be better. They've got more knowledge about the jobs market than your personal tutor would have. Okay. And then, when you know what you want, you can register with STEP. You'll find their address in the booklet. And once you've registered, they assign you to a mentor who looks after your application. And then I suppose you just sit back and wait till you hear something? They told me at the careers office that it's best to be proactive and get updates yourself. 
by checking the website for new placement alerts. Your mentor is supposed to keep you informed, but you can't rely on that. I don't suppose it's a good idea to get in touch with companies directly, is it? Not really. But it is the company who notifies you if they want you to go for an interview. You get a letter of invitation or an email from personnel department. And do I reply directly to them? Yes, you do. Step only gets involved again once you've been made a job offer. Right. So once you've had an interview, you should let your mentor know what the outcome is? I mean, whether you're offered a job and whether you've decided to accept it? That's right. They'll inform the careers office once a placement has been agreed, so you don't have to dad. Is that all then? More or less. Only once you've accepted an offer, you'll probably have to supply a reference, because the placement will be conditional on that. And that's something you should ask your own tutor to provide. He knows about your academic ability, and also about your qualities, like reliability. Well, thanks very much for the information. I'm starting to look forward to... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a talk from a member of the Conservation Society talking about green cleaning. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here as a representative of the Conservation Society to talk to you about green cleaning. In other words, about ways you can help to save the environment at the same time as saving money. I'll start with saving money, as we're all interested in that especially students who are living on a tight budget. Probably none of you has sat down and calculated how much you spend on cleaning products each year. Everything from dishwashing detergent, window cleaners and so on, through to shampoos and conditioners for your hair, and then those disasters, products to get stains out of carpets or to rescue burnt saucepans. I can see some nods of agreement even if you don't spend a lot of time on housework, you'd end up spending quite a lot of money over a period of time, wouldn't you? We can save money on products and also use products which are cheap, biodegradable and harmless to the environment. These I will call green products. Unfortunately, most cleaning products on sale commercially are none of these and many of our waterways and oceans are polluted with bleach, dioxins, phosphates and artificial colourings and perfumes. Also, think how many plastic bottles each household throws away over a year. They'll still be around in landfill when you are grandparents. So we often feel there's nothing we can do to make a difference, but we can. The actual recipes are on handouts you can take at the end of the talk. The sorts of ingredients I'm referring to are things like bicarbonate of soda, eucalyptus oil, ammonia, vinegar, lemons, pure soap. Lastly, 
Many people find they are allergic to modern products. So for all you asthma sufferers, keep listening. Nothing in these recipes should cause you any problems. An end to itching and wheezing. So let's start with spills and stains. Soda water is wonderful as an immediate stain remover. Mop up the excess spill. Don't rub, but apply soda water immediately. It's great for tea, coffee, wine, beer and milk. As is salt or bicarbonate of soda, which will absorb the stain. Then vacuum when dry and shampoo if necessary. While we're talking about disasters, let's quickly look at some others that can be avoided. Bicarbonate of soda is wonderful for removing smells, especially in the fridge. An open box in the fridge will eliminate smells for up to three months. And those terrible burnt saucepans. Either sprinkle with our good friend bicarb again and leave it to stand, or cover with vinegar and a layer of cooking salt. Bring it to the boil and simmer for 10 minutes, then wash when cool. Much cheaper than a new saucepan. Then there are heat rings on wooden furniture. Simply rub with a mixture of salt and olive oil, or for scratched furniture, use olive oil and vinegar. Now, let's look at general cleaning. First, the floors. If your floor covering is made of slate, cork or ceramic tiles or lino, it probably only needs a mop or a scrub with vinegar in a bucket of water. Carpets can be shampooed using a combination of pure soap, washing soda, cloudy ammonia and some boiling water. You put a small amount of this mixture onto the mark on the carpet, rub with a cloth until it lathers and then wipe off the excess. A smelly carpet can be deodorised by sprinkling bicarbonate of soda on the surface, leaving overnight and vacuuming off the next day. Cleaning in the kitchen, bathroom and toilet is the next section. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Conquering IELTS Writing Task 1, A Professional Approach IELTS Writing Task 1 demands a concise and objective report summarizing visual information. Here's a refined strategy to excel in this task. 1. Decipher the prompt. Meticulously examine the question and the accompanying visual, graph, chart, diagram. Identify the type of visual and the specific information it conveys. 2. Introduce with precision. Paraphrase the question in your introduction, establishing the context and nature of the visual data. Opt for formal language and avoid redundancy. 3. Craft a cohesive overview. Present a succinct summary highlighting the most prominent trends or features within the visual. This overview sets the stage for your detailed analysis. 4. Delineate with data. Dedicate subsequent paragraphs to each key feature. Utilize specific data points and figures from the visual to substantiate your explanations. Maintain a formal tone and employ transition words for smooth flow. 5. Objectivity is paramount. Refrain from expressing personal opinions or interpretations. Your report should be a factual representation of the data presented. 6. Scrutinize with care. 
Dedicate time to proofreading. Ensure your report is free of grammatical.